have tonight a lifelong Yamhill County resident, local historian, Yamhill County Historical Society board member. Let's hear it for Corey Canute. All right, there's enough people here to almost make a guy nervous. <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics. And also at the same time, I realize there's probably some people in this room that know more about some of the subject matter than I do, you know. And so if you do, I'm, I'll chat you up afterwards. Um, I kind of got my spark of interest in history. If you've been here before, you've heard the same story, so I'll make it short. But riding around the county with my grandparents who came here in the 30s and... Uh, riding around Grandpa's Buick all over Yamhill County, and he always enjoyed pointing out where things were, you know, how things were, and where this mill was, and, and of course, I, I've forgotten more than I would ever, you know, I wish I could capture all that information and still remember it, but uh, anyhow, then, then later on, uh, Yamhill County um, had a whole bunch of pictures online available that you could go through and look at old photographs. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan, who was the surveyor for Yamhill County, had put, posted them up online. And that really got me intrigued. And a lot of them had captions on them. And so I really nerded out and I looked at all those photos and started trying to figure it out all myself before I even realized, well, gosh, there's a Yamhill County Historical Society here with all this information that's so easy. And so, I'm going to take my jacket off because it's going to be here a while. Um, and so that, that triggered the interest that kept going. And uh, so here we are. Um, and I, I think I like this subject matter because, well, the title kind of tells it, right? Shenanigans, cheats. There was all kinds of sneaky, greedy ways to make the railroads happen. They did need to happen because, you know, we needed them. And so, of course, tonight we're going to be focusing on the railroads, and this uh, slideshow has been edited and reformatted to fit for tonight with great help from Tom. I, I wouldn't be able to do any of this if he didn't have all the computer knowledge to make all this come together. So, really, the thing to know is I try to take you guys back in time <clears throat> to about 1850, 1840, and you have to realize, you know, there's, there's no highways, there's no gravel. If you made gravel, you had to beat rocks with a hammer and, and make some kind of gravel. In fact, in the early days, that's where we came up with a macadamized road. You, hear, you go all over the country and sometimes you'll see macadam road. You're like, well, where, where do you get that name from? And that was a form of beating rocks into certain sizes and then throwing them out on the road, and they'd kind of do some kind of a tar surface. I might be wrong about the tar part, but that would be a macadam road. And while that's not railroad, they were searching for all kinds of different ways to make access in the Willamette Valley, which, as we know, very muddy. You know, you step off the gravel out here, it's going to be a bummer for your shoes. Um, and so that created a great problem for commerce, um, travel, and and when I say travel, you know, they're not going on a cruise. They're just trying to get to the store to buy supplies, which was virtually impossible in the wintertime pulling a wagon. You didn't pull a wagon. You'd ride a horse, you know, to go get your supplies in town. The influx of all the Oregon Trail happening from 1843 to by 1860 or even by 1855, it was a known thing that all the good tillable land had been claimed up. And so... Uh, and then here we all are on farms, rural, outside of town. And every, every uh, fall, everyone would do their, their wheat harvest. And how do you get the wheat to, in our case, it was Dayton. Dayton was the closest port to uh, get things on a steamship. You saw a steamship in the, I'll just go back to the picture so you can see it. It's so handy. So this was your very common sight down in Dayton would be uh, the uh, steamships. Some of them 100 feet long with the longest, depending on if they could get. A lot of them were 65 feet long. But like I said, the trick was getting your, your harvest to Dayton. Uh, later on, there was a grist mill in McMinnville, and there's more built throughout the valley. And the reason why that's important is a grist mill is where you would take your grain to get smashed into flour and get them into gunny sacks, and then get them to some place where you can sell them to places beyond Yamhill County, because after all, we didn't need all that wheat here. We needed to get that wheat to San Francisco 
and other places where it could just scatter into the more uh, the greater economy around the, the nation. So no roads. The only town around here in 1850 was Lafayette. So you had Oregon City, Lafayette, and Astoria, three of the oldest communities in our area. McMinnville didn't exist roughly till 1853, but that was just the birth of it. You know, it wasn't until 1870s that McMinnville was more substantially something. So railroad did come to, Mc, uh, it made it to McMinnville not until 1879. So this 1872 picture um, moves us to the next picture of these two guys. Um, this is where the shenanigans come in. So on the left here, that's Joe Gaston. And well, yeah, you can just read it down there. There's Ben Holiday. Um, ben Holiday was a great big deal in 1865. He was the largest employer in the entire United States. He owned all the over, uh, he owned a mail route to run mail from Salt Lake City uh, to Missouri and places beyond. And I'm a little, a little gray on all the details of that. But he did have 20,000 different vehicles, which have been your classic, you know, when you look at the Wells, uh, Wells Fargo bank logo, you see the carriage wagon with the big spoke wheels. Well, he sold his business to Wells Fargo. In 1866, for a million and a half dollars, he was the largest employer of that time with 15,000 employees. And so, after growing up dirt poor, and we're talking about Ben Holiday, the guy on the right, dirt poor in the hills of Kentucky in a log cabin, eventually worked real hard, he was shrewd, and I'll be frank with you, eventually crooked as a dog's hind leg, as some would say. And uh, we'll learn why later. But anyway, so he, um, he, sells, an, he sells a bunch of uh, army supplies for the American-Mexican War, and the, he makes a bunch of money off the government and running his supplies and stuff. And so eventually he gets enough money and this whole overland stagecoach thing going on, and he moves out to Oregon because he's very interested in railroad. And so he, had, he even ran for... Um, uh, a Senate position over on the East Coast because he came, eventually he went to New York City and he had two mansions over there, he had a mansion over here. And actually, Ben Holiday put Seaside, Oregon on the map. I just learned that today. I was like, well, how's that? Well, when you're of this kind of class of people back then, you were, you know, you know hobnobbing with all the big wigs and entertaining rich elite people. And because that equated to investors, and money, and he knew how to, you know, wrangle up money to make money and then just keep on making more money. And, and so he built this very elaborate beach home. He called it the cottage. Uh, kind of wish I had the picture. It's not there today. But it got it to the point where elite rich people were paying money to get on a steamship in San Francisco and come up to his resort thing in, um, in Seaside. And so that was kind of how he lubed up the money, the money tree so he could pluck it and make more money. And, but he was a very good businessman nonetheless, so I, I can't take that away from him. Uh, Joseph Gaston, he was born in Ohio and uh, made his way out here to Oregon in around 1860-ish. We'll just go with that. And uh, he was actually uh, a, a journalist down in Jacksonville, Oregon. And... Uh, eventually made his way up here to the, to the valley also with the mutual interest in railroad and journalism. So both of them have this pipe dream in the day of building a railroad that's going to service the Willamette Valley, but beyond that to parts beyond. We wanted to be connected to California. So the Golden Spike, we've seen the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. There's been just a bunch of great you know, movies you can watch about it. So after 1869, now we, we want to be connected to that. Because after all, if Yamil County, if all the parts greater of this area are all connected, then our economy is much bigger. You're, we're selling our fruit and our you know, produce, whatever we're making here, um, is now sellable on the markets beyond us. And so there was a lot of, a lot of talk about railroad from 18... So after Ben Holiday sold his... his uh, his uh, overland stagecoach thing, um, he eventually gets moving towards uh, building a railroad. So, so he, was, he was considered the stagecoach king. Um, and then there was this grant that came about. 
And so the grant was to fund the railroad. Railroads were very expensive, and railroad businesses, you know, they got their financing, and then they went broke. Somebody else bought them. They'd get the financing, and they'd get broke. And so Ben Holliday and Joe Gaston are in this fierce race to build the first 20 miles of track out of Portland towards California. And whoever gets 20 miles built first wins like a million dollar grant from the government to continue on and fund their efforts to get closer to California. So Ben Holiday, he's got his track on the east side. Called him the East Siders. And Joe Gaston, he's on the west side. That's where we get the town Gaston. And I would presume that it would be St. Joseph would be named after Joseph Gaston, but I could be wrong. Um, another thing I read said, well, Ben Holiday named it St. Joseph. And when I say St. Joseph, if you're not familiar, St. Joseph is a ghost town now, but it's between uh, kind of North McMinnville and Lafayette. And we'll see some pictures later to clear that part up. So anyhow, um, Ben Holiday wins this million dollar grant. However, Joe Gaston, he had his line 46 miles all the way to uh, St. Joseph and stopped. Well, clearly he would have been the winner, you'd think, right? Well, no. So some reading says that there was a $55,000 questionable situation where uh, Ben Holiday did a backdoor deal with somebody in government, and he won. And so he's the winner. He's on the east side. And even so, on that 20 miles of track that he had on the other side, going out through Oregon City, there's a little town area called New Era. Um, that's about where it ended. And his, his bridge over the Clackamas, Clackamas River, it was like 380 feet long. It collapsed and fell into the river during a flood. But wow, he was still the winner. So <laughs> imagine that. And uh, now this created a problem. And the problem is uh, we're still over here in Yamio County. Yeah, some of you recognize that as the, uh, the overpass when you're going to Lafayette. And the reason why this is important is that's about where the railroad ended. That's the St. Joseph area. And St. Joseph was actually plotted to have 75 blocks. And by 1860, there was about 150 houses in the area. Today, you go out there, and it's, it's a dairy, and there's a nursery, and some farmland, and some farmhouses. But it essentially kind of fell off the map with McMinnville growing and Lafayette. We'll, we'll cover more later why that was the case. This is the hotel in St. Joseph. I like to point out the fact that meals, 25 cents. I'm sorry we can't price match that with the concessions today. But and I do believe this hotel was moved into Lafayette later when they didn't really need it in St. Joseph anymore. Um, so St. Joseph was the end of the line. So what does that mean if you're a farmer in, I don't know, let's say you live in Perrydale or Sheridan and you have all this harvest that you need to get to, at one point it was Dayton. Well, you would have to wait after harvest to get everything winnowed out, sorted out, all the chaff out of the wheat and you get it all ready to take to Dayton to ship it out. And by then it's too rainy, too muddy, if you pull your carriage out of the barn, it's going to go up to the axles in mud. No gravel, no roads. There was trails and roads, you know, but nothing to haul a uh, wagon on. You'd have to wait till it was frozen and cold in the winter, and you'd have one rough ride on a wagon down to Dayton on frozen ground, and that's how you could get your harvest to Dayton. And uh, later on, uh, so Ben Holiday ran as far and long as he could with... Uh, this east side railroad and moving south. But with all of his shenanigans and different things he did, um, he eventually fell to the woe of the panic of 1873. It was like our 1929 stock market crash and investors were freaking out, pulling their money out and he went broke. And, and his investors from back east and points beyond, they really weren't too sure that he was really telling the story, you know? Because he had a way of sandbagging his profits and hiding uh, so his investors were never getting any dividends and he was building more things, you know, like mansions and things like that. So they send out Henry Villard. And he was a pretty, pretty good guy. He, uh, he grew up in Germany 
and he escaped, I say escaped, he essentially ran away from home at the age of 18 with a disagreement with his dad who was like a high up Supreme Court judge in Germany. So he gets his way out here to Oregon and long story short, eventually he's here in Oregon and he's interested in, because uh, actually the reason why he's connected to the railroad was because German money was fronting Ben Holiday's venture out here. And so, lots of details. Anyhow, come to find out, yep, Ben Holiday really, truly was broke. And so he was bankrupt, destitute, done. Ben's out of there. Here's Henry Villard. And he continued on that endeavor to make railroad go down to California. He worked on the railroad through the Columbia Gorge because he wanted to tie up with the Northern Pacific that connected him to the Midwest. And we didn't want to bring as much, well, it just, it was a closer route for us. All this tension, all this stuff's going on, but my main point is Yamhill County really doesn't have a railroad. It stops in St. Joe. All the tracks you see around here, they weren't there yet. And so, um, some locals got together, even with uh, inspiration and help from Joe Gaston. They collected enough, you know, money and interest. Everybody wanted railroad, unlike today. If you want to do a right-of-way, public right-of-way easement through someone's property, everyone wants to say, no, not on my property, not in my backyard, you know. However, it was different back then because every farmer would love to have, it'd be like this, it'd be like the same thing of having I-5 come by without all the traffic noise, per se. And you could put your grain right in that gondola and ship it to Dayton. So it was easy to talk farmers into uh, a railroad coming in and so what they did, they did a creative way because it kind of lacked capital. They told the farmers, they said, well, we will do railroad script. Long story short, if you allow us to come through here, um, you can ship all your stuff for free. I'm like, well, that's a pretty good deal. And the only other thing you need to do is supply firewood for our locomotive. This locomotive was, uh, oh yeah, it's right here. We got the Pioneer and the Progress. So they bought two identical uh, steam locomotives shipped them from back east. It came, uh, I believe, around the Horn to San Francisco, then up through Astoria, up the Columbia River, and then uh, past the locks in Oregon City. Those were completed in 1873, so we could get a ship over those falls, if you've seen them from Oregon City, I-205. And so they get these two locomotives to Dayton, <coughs> and there they are sitting on the, on the barge, or whatever you want to call it, the ship, and they can't get it up the hill. The water was even lower than they had planned for, and they laid temporary tracks down to the boat, and with much effort and head scratching and a team of mules and like some stump puller or some kind of a, uh, a gear pulley system, they geared it down and got to where they could get these locomotives up onto the flatland. And so these little locomotives weighed 12 ton, um, which kind of sounds like a lot, but it really isn't that much, right? Uh, 12 ton, it was a two, uh, two, four, O oh wheel arrangement. And so when you're looking at these locomotives, um, they start at the front and we're talking about the, wheel, the count on the wheels. So you have drive wheels, the big ones that you see on the choo-choo train, right? And then you have these <coughs> front wheels that are out front. And so two, uh, four, zero means that there is four wheel, uh, there, you know, they're set in the front and then the drive wheels in the back. Well, anyway, maybe that's not important, but um, they get these up on the line and they're going, and this is November 14th of 1878. Uh, 1877 was when it started, and then they built it for a year in 1878. I think the next picture is going to be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, this is a great one. So this is the waterfront in Dayton. And someone's standing on a bridge. Um, or they're standing on the top of a steamship. I can't prove that there was a bridge there. Maybe there wasn't, but um, these are all uh, warehouses, and uh, there was the red warehouse, the white one. There was this milk evaporating plant, and what you see here, it's hard to see from your distance, and I apologize, but there's like little ladders and ways to get down to these boats. Obviously, this would have been more of a winter picture because the water's pretty low, and the reason why I also use this picture for trains is because you can't see it very good but there's a little locomotive here so the next picture zooms in now you can see that locomotive that was the same picture and that's the little 
the little locomotive that we're talking about. This is one of the older pictures in our uh, collection. But could you imagine walking down this little, it's like a quasi ladder slash stairway with, you know, 100 pounds of feet on your back. Crazy. Now that's today what it looks like. Today there's a little footbridge that was built 20 some years ago, maybe longer. And so I kind of like doing before and afters. So there you go, before and after. Um, there's a little boat ramp down there today that you can go down and float the river. I've done it many times, enjoy that. Um, now I'm just gonna kind of take you on a tour of the old narrow gauge railroad. That was something I didn't mention. So this was narrow gauge. What I mean by that is the rails were closer together. Standard gauge rails, when you drive around town here and see railroad tracks, everywhere in the country, it's been standardized. It's all four foot, eight and a half inches apart, the rails. And uh, this was narrow gauge. Narrow gauge was, for the reason being, it was more maneuverable in tight areas, especially for logging railroads. Um, it was more affordable, it was a little cheaper. And so, being the poor farmers that we were, that was the natural uh, choice. And so, I'm taking you here because this was, uh, this is just east of the airport. See the air, I'm standing in your way, you probably can't see it. Uh, there's the airport. And this is the little uh, front edge road that goes around it, Crookshank Road. There's an oak grove here. Next picture shows you what I'm talking about. Well, this was a little railroad depot. I've got a little letter, uh, some nice little lady wrote probably 20 years ago and she talked about when she was a child, she caught a, a train from, I think maybe it was Sheridan, went to Whiteson and then went and got off on the Soli Junction or something like that. And that was like 1903. <clears throat> and so, of course today, that railroad's not there, but this right here is actually the grading of the old railroad. It's still a, still visible from satellite or airplane. It looks more like a ditch now, and probably because they dug out all the ballast and used that valuable rock somewhere else if they didn't have a railroad there. William Reed, he was the guy waiting for the Farmer's Railroad to fail. Now that makes him sound like a bad guy. He, he was actually a, a great guy too. Nothing like Ben Holiday. Hopefully there's nobody related to Ben Holiday here. You're gonna hate me, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's gonna be on the internet, woof. Well, anyway, William Reed, uh, Scottish descent, he comes here and he scoops up Farmer's Railroad and he has Scottish money. And one, the reason why this was possible is because Ben Holiday, the guy we're talking about before, created this ability for foreign entities or investors to invest in American infrastructure. So now, because you know, we were still only a country a hundred and some years old, and we didn't have a lot of capital. We were still just trying to inhabit this unclaimed territory. Well, with that comes no cash, but you're property rich, correct? So he comes by and he scoops up the Farmer's Railroad that lasted three months. They opened like in November or October or something like that. Uh, scooped up all the farmer's harvests, got them to Dayton, and then what happens? Well, human nature kicks in. And what is human nature? Honestly, I have to admit it, we're all kind of selfish, aren't we? Well, the farmers who were obligated to set firewood out to keep the, uh, the engine you know, fueled, because it was a wood-burning engine, well, they didn't put the firewood out anymore. So consequently, the, the, you know, the engineer would be coming by and was like, no wood, no, oh my gosh, we're not gonna make it to Sheridan, you know? And so, well, they stop the locomotive, they start pulling apart some farmer's fences and throw it in there and burn it up. Then they keep going. Well, then they're coming back, bam, they hit a cow, you know? And of course, farmer is like, that was my best cow, you know? It was worth the most amount of money, you know? And so, anyway, there, there wasn't really much of a regular uh, timetable if you're in Sheridan. And while the, the railroad was called the Dayton, Sheridan, and Willamina Railroad, it actually never made it to Willamina, it just made it to Sheridan. And later it did get to, under another ownership, to uh, places further on, like to Grand Ron. Um, but they would stop and do deer hunting along the way. You know, you know, engineers, like, there wasn't any real pressure, you know. People were just glad they had a train, you know. And so, then there wasn't any competition, per se, in that area. And uh, 
So William Reed develops uh, quite a network of rails, and in the meanwhile, he's becoming a threat to Henry Villard, a guy who took over for Ben Holiday. The narrow gauge went all the way down to Sheridan, and then at Broadmead, who knows where Broadmead's at? Good. Well, at Broadmead, there was a Y there, and it went down towards Perrydale, and to points beyond down to Arley. And Arley was named after the Earl of Arley from Scotland, and so you know, that's where we get some of our names from. And it's also where we get Dundee, Dundee, Scotland. So about 19, not at 19, 1880, Dayton has a big old flood. They always had floods because they're right there on the river. And we didn't have all the reservoirs up in the Cascades like for flood control, like Detroit Lake, Foster Lake. Um, so Dayton gets kind of wiped off the map down in the riverfront area. Wipes out the roundhouse, which is a way to turn a, a locomotive around. You'd, you'd, turn, you'd, you'd want to turn the, you'd want to flip your engine around, so they wheel it around, so 180, and then now you can head back towards Sheridan. Well, with all these things lost, um, William Reed says, look, we'll rebuild here. I don't really want to, but if Dayton and all you people want to invest into this, I'll take $8,000 and we'll rebuild. And Dayton said, mm, nah, not really. As, you know, Dayton, <laughs> Dayton was like, you need us. We are the waterfront. Where else are you going to go? And so he thought, I'll find another place that doesn't have this problem. And uh, so he went over to Dundee. And when you're coming into Dundee, there's Full Courts Landing Road, or maybe it's just called Full Courts Road. It's right on the right. Have you ever sat there in traffic in the double lanes and someone cuts on the side on the fog line and you're temporarily really mad? But then they turn on that county road and you're like, oh, okay, all right, I guess they're not so terrible. <laughs> well, Full Courts Landing Road goes straight back to the Willamette River, and that was a perfect place for William Reed to build his new landing. And so he correlates or coordinates with uh, the farmer Ray on the other side that was called Ray's Landing. He had a little ferry service. Eventually they built track on the other side of the river from Full Courts Landing, and they had track going all the way down to Coburg, which we see on the map almost down to Eugene. And uh, a lot of that railroad grade is, some of it's still used today, a lot of it was abandoned down there on the southern end. Um, there are no tracks on the other side of the Willamette River today. Um, and so Dundee became the headquarters, and I think we're gonna see some pictures. Well, this backs up my idea that Dayton flooded. That <laughs> the river would be down over here over on the other side of the fir trees. This is Ferry Street, and Lots, lots of water. This is a part that I found that I thought I was pretty clever. Um, this map is important because uh, I'll, just, I'll just blow my cover here and show you why I'm talking about. This is a trestle that existed from, it was the old narrow gauge railroad, and this ran from behind Dayton Meat Company. Everybody know where Dayton Meat Company is? On Fletch, I think it's Fletcher Road. Um, if you're on that back road coming from... Uh, Lafayette, down the south end, and you want to go to Dayton. When you turn left, go into Dayton. Well, you're not coming into Dayton, you're still in the country. And there's like a Filbert Orchard on your right, and Dayton Meat Company on the left. Well, right through that area, ran a trestle, and this was the old original narrow gauge railroad that William Reed built to get over to Dundee. So he kind of, he left a feeder line, I think, that may have gone a little closer to Dayton, although I don't think, I may be wrong about that, and I probably am, but Anyway, this here shows you Fletcher Road, Lafayette Highway, Lafayette's right here, Dayton Meat Company's here, and oh, I can even see it. Still to this day, these uh, right-of-ways exist in a farm field where the trestle stood, and the alignment comes up perfectly to Locks Road. So when you're on the east side of Lafayette and you want to go down to the Locks Park, who's seen the Locks Park, right? Uh, you're driving on an old railroad grade for about a quarter mile there, maybe a little longer. And uh, then it was turned into a county road. And we'll talk about the locks on another presentation. That's another interesting subject matter. But for today, that was basically the access grading that went to that railroad trestle. And here's the, uh, you can even see it's being farmed different. Somebody owns this little strip and the property lines up with Dayton Meat, but no railroad today. It was taken out after the turn of the century, 1908, somewhere in there. And, uh, 
And the reason being was because when Villard took over, he was like, well, I don't, I'm not going to pay the money to change the narrow gauge over to standard gauge. It's a duplicate line because they had had the line that goes up to Yamil Carlton. That's, you know, that's the area that we're talking about doing a bike trail. Um, and that, that area was decommissioned in 1984, 1985, some more recent times. And so essentially, William, not William, but uh, Bill, uh, Villard now, Villard eventually took over this narrow gauge railroad, and that's something I did leave out. And he took it over by a little bit of a sneaky way because William Reed was needing more money to invest to keep going because William Reed wanted to get his railroad down to Winnemucca or somewhere down in Nevada and join up with the Transcontinental Railroad on the south end there. And so some investors propped him up and then kind of pushed him out, and then they shut down uh, parts of the narrow gauge railroad. And the line that still exists today goes from Whiteson to Sheridan. That's the original narrow gauge farmer railroad. It runs right past the little pig farm I grew up on just west of Whiteson. And so that sparked some interest for me as a kid watching the train go by all the time, and that was back when they actually had a caboose on it. And so, and here's a guy sitting at the railroad depot, uh, depot on the east side, it says, in front of the narrow gauge do, uh, depot, just east of town, east of Lafayette is what they meant. And so that, that fits the description of Locks Road, and uh, it would have came up there and then followed the grade that we see today that goes by Creter Road and past uh, McDougal Corner. This is another, they call them a feeder line or a side line or a siding. This isn't necessarily a siding, it's a spur that ran up to the prune orchards up in Dundee. Uh, the hills out of Dundee had as many as I believe 18,000 acres of prunes back in the day. All of them, not just Dundee Hills, but we had a lot of prunes and there was a fruit dryer up there and so this is the uh, next picture will look a little more familiar to you. How's that? You're in Dundee. There's Lumpy's. <laughs> and the railroad ran perpendicular right across the highway right there. And of course, this is now an old picture because now it's a lot. They just redid it all again. Um, so that's the same picture, same angle, same direction. So before and after. And all it was was just a rail that went up the hill and got a little too steep. I don't know, they may have had to cable the freight cars up there and fill them up and lower them back down. Um, but that's how they would get the fruit off of the hill after it was dried and get it onto the markets beyond us. There's the, uh, this, you know, Dundee was the headquarters for the, the Scott guy, the uh, William Reed's Railroad. And so this was his main office and hotel. It was very common to have hotels at the depot. Uh, even McMinnville had a restaurant in the depot, and like the last presentation I talked about, <clears throat> it was also rumored to be a place of a late evening business, like a brothel. And that is how we got the phrase, the red light district. You go, where did we come up with the red light district idea? Well, the signalmen, the guys that ran the trains, had a red lantern for signaling the engineer from the front to the back of the train. Well, when they went into the hotel, and maybe they were doing business, um, the lantern sat outside the door, and that was the red light district. So they'd be like, ooh, might, might be something going on in there. Anyhow, so we kind of covered these things, the Full Courts Landing, Winnemucca, Scottish Money, the Villard Takeover. Villard, um, although he was a great, great man, he wasn't greedy. He really was for helping out the Northwest. He really did have a pretty good monopoly on the whole Northwest Railroad for a time around 1880 and a little beyond. He went back to uh, Scotland and offered the investors 7% when William Reed was uh, only giving them 4.5%. So naturally they took the 7% and then William Reed was boop, gone. Lawsuit later, he won some money back but it was too late. and. Uh, here we have the Oregonian, uh, engine number five. This is the Whiteson Hotel in the background. I find this fascinating. Um, so the alignment of this picture is you're standing on the west side of the tracks looking towards Whiteson. Everybody knows where Whiteson is. It's just south of here between Amity. Um, and that is the Whiteson Hotel. It had a wraparound porch all the way around it. And we're going to see a few more pictures to help you with the alignment of that. 
But basically, when you're on 99W going through Whiteson, you would drive right through that hotel. If it, if it were to stand there today, that's the footprint. It's right pretty much where the highway is and the right side of the ditch. And right now is kind of an interesting time to drive past that, this area where the hotel is because uh, they had landscaping outside of the hotel. And still to this day, Vinca Major, which is a little periwinkle, blue flowering plant. Anybody have that in your yard? Periwinkle? It's hard to get rid of it. Yeah, <laughs> stuff's wicked. And that's why it's still alive there today. So you go by and you go, why did the, why did the railroad guys plant you know, periwinkle in the ditch, you know. Uh, and there's daffodils that pop up and little rose. It's just kind of intriguing, you know. Plant, the plants keep going, and uh, the hotel is long gone. And uh, just another interesting picture. These, uh, some of these locomotives were, uh, uh, they upgraded those narrow-gauge railroad uh, engines, locomotives, to heavier duty. Um, when I mentioned the first two, the Progress and the Pioneer were the name of those two first little uh, engines, <coughs> they only weighed 12 ton. Today, when you see those locomotives go by, uh, each wheel is displacing 12 ton. That's how much heavier, and they have, well, the ones here in town have two axles in the front, two on the back, they're missing the middle axle typically. Yes? So those early ones were about the size of our Peerless. Of the what? Our careless steam tractor? Yeah. Engine? Yep. And another funny thing was when they built that narrow gauge railroad, they, were, they didn't have any money. So instead of using real railroad ties, they used the slab mill ends off of beams that were like kind of <laughs> half shape. And they didn't make a very good, there wasn't much meat to drive a tie in to t fasten you know, the rails to the uh, ties. I, was that true? I don't know. Uh, that's the way I heard it. Um, and the track weight, those, uh, the track was like 28 pounds per foot or lighter. Today's mainline track can weigh up to 50 pounds almost for the higher speed railroad and stuff like that. This is another good picture. So this is Whiteson again. In the background, you see that shading. That's the Amity Hill. And here's the hotel. And railroad still exists today in the same exact spot. This is the little depot. It's probably a little bigger than most of your guys' garden sheds. But it uh, was also the place of a few mishaps. The reason being was you had two competing railroads perpendicularly crossing over. So from this angle, you can kind of see Amity Hill lightly in the background. We're facing south. And this was after the hostile takeover. I'd like to make the story sexier and say it was a com competitors hitting each other, but I, I don't think so. Um, so, but at one time, you did have the narrow gauge railroad going from Sheridan to Dayton. And they did absolutely nothing to correlate their schedules together. They didn't want to cooperate. Uh, they didn't want to help each other. And what I mean by that is the uh, North-South Railroad, which was owned by Villard or Ben Holiday to start with, um, they just didn't correlate together. Eventually, the North-South line that we see today bought out all of it. And now we see what we see today. And then... The, the road that goes through the middle of Whiteson today, it's called Railroad Street. That was the railroad grade for a time right there, and then it veered northeast towards Dayton through uh, Ray Cowers property and out past the airport. And we were just talking about the Solis Junction earlier. That's the same line. And all those lines today, gone. The line, the trestle that goes over by the Locks Loop Park, gone. And there's what it looks like today. So back, there we go, back then, today, and uh, this is a little old railroad house, still owned by Southern Pacific, or leased to the current railroad. And I don't know, maybe the brakemen and some of them stayed the night in there of some kind of an office, but it wasn't a passenger office or anything like that. And I'll be honest, I don't know, it might not even be there today, this picture's about five years old. It's in pretty good disrepair. So another interesting story with railroad was a lot of the towns around the area, anywhere in the nation, were guilty of just assuming that, well, the railroad needs us because we're a town. You know, they, they want to they wanna build their railroad to come through our town because of the commerce and maybe the money-making possibilities. Well, um, that's what Lafayette thought. That's what Yamhill thought. And yet railroad, although railroad does go through Lafayette today, 
that happened later. So Carleton, uh, Oregon, became a town because it happened to be a spot where the locomotive came by and, you know, the water came out of the tank and filled up the steam locomotive to make steam. Well, while the thing stopped, it makes a great opportunity to make a depot and then build a town around it. And so Carleton had that advantage, and uh, McMinnville didn't. So uh, McMinnville, it's, you know, we got the county seat in 1888. <clears throat> we still didn't have railroad. Um, I got ahead of myself, but 1879, railroad came to McMinnville. And how and why? Well, it's because we knew that we would have to do, we'd have to spend some money, get some volunteer time to get them to build two extra giant trestles to reroute the railroad into McMinnville. I wonder if the next picture is of Yamhill County. Great. So here, here's what's so inefficient. I know it's kind of small, but so you're, you know, the, the original railroad that came down through Yamhill Carlton, it stopped between Lafayette and McMinnville, and then it went another almost a half mile to the Yamhill River. And that's where really where St. Joseph, the town, was located. The, they had plotted 75 uh, different blocks with houses on them. It never, it never took off. But there was, like I said, about 150 houses there. Well, when McMinnville said, hey, we want railroad, they took up about a half mile of track, and then they relayed it towards McMinnville, and they came across the tallest trestle in the valley ever built at that time, 85 feet tall, the trestle that goes by the Cascade Steel Rolling Mills, over, over there by the uh, graveyard, you know, on the other side. And then the other trestle that was a monster, the Bayou Trestle, doesn't that even look, that even looks familiar today, although the bridge is pretty uh, primitive. So here we are today. So there's your before and after. And uh, so it cost something like an extra $100,000 for McMinnville to convince the railroad to reroute and come our way, and it was one of the best things we did. And so then we had a station in McMinnville, and one of the main routines for people coming from Portland to Corvallis, especially when the Red Electric Railroad came about, we'll be talking about that shortly, um, McMinnville was the noon stop where people would stop, eat lunch, and then they'd carry on to points further south. Here's the McMinnville Depot, and this is not the Red Electric Railroad because this is just one of those regular Pullman cars, or, uh, and they were nicely adorned. Southern Pacific had some very nice interior. They put some effort into convincing you that it was a great experience. It was actually a reason for people to dress up and be fancy, just to ride the railroad. Here is a aerial view taken from a tank, tank tower that was taken down in the 50s. And it's of the same area. We were looking at this station here, and uh, Tom informed me recently, and I had forgotten, but the old depot was actually between the tracks previously. And they moved it over, and then they built this one today that we see today. Built in 1913, 1912, opened in 1913, and this was to service the Red Electric Railroad. See this little trolley? There's electrified lines that went clear from Portland to Corvallis. Um, and you could jump in one of these little red electric railroads. This didn't happen until 1913 to 1928, and uh, more on that a little bit later. There's even a better picture of uh, the depot. And uh, again, it was a hotel, a restaurant, a freight, you know, uh, freight office. And then there's the new one for red electric. And uh, there's another red electric. And it, it, wasn't, it was named Red Electric because the cars were red. And they had round windows that were very distinct. Some people called it old owl eyes. Um, but they were very nicely adorned, beautiful cars. And you'd see them rolling up and down the valley. Anybody recognize this structure? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dundee, right? Mm -hmm. So that is where they would have a jumper station to keep the lines charged up to 1,500 volts. Uh, it, was, it was one of the largest, uh, I forget how that went, but it was an impressive uh, network of cables and overhead tram wires. And now you have to ask yourself, why? Well, the reason why was because running a steam locomotive with a full crew, pulling cars, expending all that fuel to pull a few passengers somewhere, it doesn't pencil. And so Southern Pacific wised up and they said, well, let's create something more affordable for the public to use that we'll actually make money on. 
So let's eliminate the steam locomotive and all the entourage that comes with it, and we could do a, a trolley. And you could hook multiple cars, you'll see in a few pictures. Uh, so anyway, this was the, uh, every, I don't know if it's 20 miles or so, they would have one of these big stations. There's one down by McCoy. I don't know if that one's still there or not. It is. Still there. is it? Yes. And so that was another one. I, I assume it looked like this, does it? They all do. Yeah, they all do. And so here we have a, it's, this is the Red Electric in Whiteson. And Whiteson was a Red Electric stop as well, because after all, people from Sheridan needed to get on the Red Electric Railroad. So that's why they also needed a hotel in Whiteson. And believe it or not, Whiteson was a big deal in its day. You know, they had all kinds of stores. They had a school, they had a post office. Um, growing up, I knew a old farmer in the area that graduated from Whiteson High School, you know. Um, there's the Red Electric out in the countryside, probably south of Amity, I'm guessing. And same thing, again, you can see the overhead wires that would power the uh, trolley. And anytime someone had a camera out in those days, it was a big deal to have your image captured for life forever in history, because it may be, it might only happen once in your life. If, uh, especially if you're a farm kid somewhere out in you know, rural areas. Now again, there's a great depiction of the uh, front of the, the Red Electric. And this was a nice little area to stand under, still there today, for passengers to wait if it's rainy for the next trip out. Corey? Yes? You see the end on there with two round windows? Yes. Go back one. Three round windows. Oh, yeah. Oh. Any idea? It might be the back of the car, or it might be the front of the car. I don't know. You probably have three windows if you're driving the thing. You know, I, I don't know. As, a, as an engineer, I think you'd want to have three windows instead of two. I'm only guessing. So I just make stuff up and people believe it. No. <laughs> so <laughs> later, there'll be people correcting me, right? Carlton, um, you know, I don't know if that same station is still there. I think. I haven't done my research on that, but there is a railroad depot in Carlton. That's, the, that's the first one. Okay. And it's a little wider, the new one. Okay, okay. And looking at this, that looks to be only about 14 or 16 feet wide. And the new one, I know the one that's in town is much wider than that. And we won't cover the other railroad because we just don't have enough time. But there's the Carlton and Coast Railroad, some of you have heard about. It had, it started, yeah, and there's a tavern named after it in Carlton now. Um, but it had, at one time, 79 miles of track that went up past Flangham Ranch, all over there, and it was a, it was a logging railroad. Here we are, 1930, pulling down those uh, tram wires that powered up the Red Electric. <clears throat> uh, all good things must come to an end. At that point, it was no longer lucrative for Southern Pacific to run the Red Electric. Yes? How far did the Red Electric go? I know it went to Corvallis. I but don't know if it ever made way. it to Eugene. I know it was up in Portland because it, yeah, it went, home it went through. Yeah, it yeah, made it to Portland. Told me about riding it. I wish I could remember the fares. It was something like, oh man, I, I think two dollars or something to go to Corvallis and back or something like that. Super cheap. Don't quote me on that. And uh, Willamina. Well. Willamina wasn't a part of the Farmers Railroad, although it made it into the name. It was called the Dayton, Sheridan, and Willamina Railroad. They didn't make it to Willamina until 1913. And when they did, it was under ownership of uh, not the farmers anymore. It was with Henry Villard, or actually it was more of a Southern Pacific thing by then. But notice it's made out of brick. Mm -hmm. Willamina, obviously well known if you know this, it was famous for their brick plant. And one reason why they added more railroad was to get the bricks on railroad and get them shipped out. And that only makes sense. Uh, on the opening day, 1913, whatever month and day that was, they had a big festival and people playing horns and it was a big deal. Uh, imagine railroad was a huge deal. People would come from all over just to see a new locomotive come into town. A lot of times railroad road would put on a farm demonstration and they would show what they would talk about. I don't quite know, you know. But people, all the farmers would come around, and it was to uh, 
you know, it was a PR thing to produce interest and, you know, people would possibly put a siding next to their silo and use the railroad to haul their stuff. Uh, well, on this particular day, on the opening day, the fancy day, the uh, locomotive is finally making it to Willamina on brand new tracks. And as it's rolling into the station, just a little ways from the station, it derailed. <laughs> Poor Willamina. And uh, just like the red uh, electric uh, railroad, there had to be other crafty, thrifty little ways to save money and service the needs of the area. One of these such ways was the galloping goose. Um, what it was, was a, uh, a conventional gas-powered bus. Uh, they trans, you know, they, they redid it and they put railroad trucks on the bottom, a little cow scoop in the front. And these particular ones didn't even have any kind of a nose on the front, they were just stub nose. And there's quite a little story with the Galloping Goose. I think it only ran for about eight years until about 1928 or 29. About the same time the Red Electric shut down, well then, uh, what's your use of, you know, connecting people to Whiteson? And I don't know that it actually went to Whiteson. I know, though, it did go from Sheridan to Willamina and points beyond uh, at some point. Well, anyway, um, the, the railroad guys called it the motor. And it, it's like, well, and some people call it the Galloping Goose. And like, well, why would they call it the Galloping Goose? I don't know. Maybe it kind of waddled when it went down the tracks. It wasn't the smoothest riding thing. That was noted. It wasn't very much padding on the wood benches. And uh, it serviced the area well until it was no longer needed. And no longer needed because we had gravel, Model A's, cars. And people were starting to be able to afford their own transportation that wasn't powered by a horse. And uh, so the Galloping Goose... It was, uh, it was sold and used again in Condon, Oregon area um, on the east side of the Cascades. And then eventually it ended up at the Mount Hood Railroad. And uh, I believe there's a, maybe a fellow in here that had something to do with it. Uh, Gary? Yes? It's back in Walmart with the new top on. Yes. And so due to this fellow's great effort, he uh, had to do a lot of head scratching and proof with evidence that this cart was actually indeed the galloping goose that came from Willamina and not the one uh, that originated in Mount Hood Railroad. Mount Hood Railroad, I believe, ran like five of them or something. And at one point, they did sell one of their buses to the Condon area. And so there was a lot of technicalities that I'm not totally up to speed on. But basically, out of a lot of effort, um, Gary was able to prove that this galloping goose that was in possession again of Mount Hood Railroad was indeed originated in Wilmina. And so, so today, if you go to Wilmina, you can see this, this little bus back to its original color. And again, see the little, uh, little cow scoop on it. And uh, again, gas powered, very affordable to run. It ran mail back and forth, I believe, to the towns, Sheridan and Wilmina. And uh, and I don't know what the future plans are for it. I know at one point it's a very expensive endeavor. It wasn't their original idea was to, to give rides at one point. And it's just so expensive. It, at one point I know, and I don't know what year this was, maybe in the 80s, <clears throat> was it like $167,000 per mile to restore some track or something? I don't know. And now it would probably be a half a million dollars. I don't know. So this is just a taste of some of the railroad that's in Yamil County. Um, there's more, and there's stuff I have probably, a half hour's worth of stuff I probably forgot to mention, and you're probably thankful for that. Um, but that's a wrap for tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, coming up in, uh, what is it, July? You know, I, I should know the dates. Um, we will be doing another Secrets of the Past. I'll rely on Pam to fill in the information. But we will be having Barbara Mitchell from Flying M Ranch here to give some history of the Flying M Ranch area, the Trask Toll Road, which included a Summit House, and it was a stagecoach line that ran from Yam Hill all the way over the top of Trask Mountain and down into Tillman. Advertised, not advertised, but some of the people remarked it was the worst ride in their life. <laughs> and uh, so there'll, there'll be some good stories with that. 
And uh, that's again, that's coming in July. And I think the little deals are on your table, so I'm not telling you anything brand new, I guess. I, I just don't have one up here. So thank you so much.